Okay, it is now uh, noon Eastern on Wednesday, April 8th. Thank you so much for joining us on today's webinar to talk about uh, that will focus in on student support in a distance learning space. Uh, this is part of our weekly academic leaders webinar series. I'll note that today's session is being recorded uh, by request from a number of folks, and we're going to post this up on YouTube later on. Um, so just keep that in mind as we get into the Q&A portion of this uh, later on. Um, a couple of programming notes. Go ahead to the next slide, Jasper. These will continue at noon on Wednesdays. We're going to shorten them and keep them at a half an hour so that um, uh, we can pack as much good material into that time period for you as possible and use the time most effectively for you. I'll note that next week's topic is going to be standardized assessments to identify gaps in learning. And we'll be joined by uh, Tom Rashan and Glenn Molesky from ERB to talk about that topic. I know that folks have been really interested in hearing about how we might use things like standardized assessments in order to identify some of these gaps. And so Tom and Glenn will be joining us next week. Just also a couple of reminders, our phase two uh, uh, online learning courses are still continuing to go on. We have a version for teachers and a version for administrators that helps think about how we can prepare for the remainder of the school year to be online. I know that many of you in this room already are part of the Academic Leaders Listserv. If you aren't a part of that, go to our COVID-19 page and you'll see the way to sign up for that. And on Wednesday and Thursday uh, afternoons, uh, we have teacher meetups uh, for middle school teachers on Wednesday afternoons and for upper school teachers on Thursday afternoons. Uh, so hope to have your teachers join us there. Uh, whatever we can do, of course, to help you in this time, please don't hesitate to let us know. We are all ears and just wanna be as helpful as we possibly can for your work. Um, this session and our future webinars will continue to focus on Q and A. So as you have questions here, please don't hesitate to click the little Q&A button on the bottom of the Zoom and type your questions in. Uh, I'll be monitoring those, those questions as they come in uh, so that uh, we can pose them to Liz. So without further ado, I'm just gonna introduce Liz quickly. Many of you know her already. Liz is our Director of Student and School Support at One Schoolhouse. Um, she's an amazing, amazing resource and uh, thinker in this space and has been doing great work to support students' progress both in face-to-face -face independent schools and now online. Liz herself is a graduate of Windsor School um, and has worked at a wide range of independent schools from the Cranbrook Schools to Exeter to uh, Rocky Hill School and others um, and has been working with us in the online learning space at One Schoolhouse for three years. So she brings a really unique perspective, I think, to this conversation today um, and one that everybody's gonna wanna see. Jasper, you can pull the slides down now so that everybody can see Liz a little bit more. And Liz, I'm just going to start by posing a really general first question to you. And that is, what's different about supporting kids in a distance or online learning environment compared to how you support kids in face-to-face -face schools? Sure. Thanks, Brad. Um, and thanks, everybody who's joining us today. So the first thing um, that I think is really important to note, which is not going to be new to any of you as you're spending your time in distance learning, is that um, the tools that our experienced and, um, and fantastic teachers usually have at their fingertips in the classroom aren't there in the online space. So when I was a classroom teacher, I could read the room. I could see when people were losing attention. Um, I would notice if a student's quiz answers were really different than they usually were. Um, or if they looked really tired, or, um, or when somebody suddenly changed their seat and wasn't sitting next to their good friend anymore, all of those things are pieces of data that we take in without thinking about them. When you're online, you have to use data in a different way, and your data is different. Um, so the first thing that's really important to do is to identify what those markers are that raise your flags of concern. So for us at One Schoolhouse, um, there are a few that are probably really similar to what you do in your face-to-face -face classroom. So we get worried if grades drop before, beneath a certain point. Um, we get worried if somebody's average drops suddenly. And, um, but there are also a few that are a little different. Um, we get worried if a student is missing more than two assignments. Um, and I'll talk more about why that is sort of our threshold number. 
Um, and we get worried um, if a student isn't responding to messages. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we know about students working in an online space is that when students have a hard time, they go downhill pretty quickly, usually. Um, and so we want to try to be at the front edge of, um, we'd, rather, we'd rather raise the flag early and then be able to pull it back down rather than being in the position of waiting late and having a bigger situation to sort out. Um, you know, Liz, can we pause there for one second? Because I know you're, you're, you're going to continue along with this, but there, there's something really key there about what you said, that we want to make sure that we are on top of the situation even sooner in this type of setting. That can sometimes be a difficult thing for administrators to help faculty members understand it, can it? Yep. So one of the things that we do at one schoolhouse, just like every school, is we have a set of expectations um, in, terms of, um, in terms of grading. So we expect our teachers to, uh, to grade work when it comes in within five days, not too different from most independent schools. The reason why that's really essential for us and why we emphasize it with our teachers is that that is often one of the warning signs. So frequently teachers will say, oh, you know what? He is such a great student. I just want to give him the benefit of the doubt and give him a few extra days to turn that in. And what we've learned is that um, if we frame our support not as punitive and not as disciplinary, but instead as supportive and as growth focused, then students understand that our, uh, our raising our concerns isn't about getting them in trouble. It's making sure that they have what they need and that they're getting the tools and support um, in their, from their face-to-face -face schools, but also from us online. That's great. So I know I interrupted you there too in terms of some of the other differences that you see in the online space. <laughs> sure. Um, so the other one, um, I mentioned that when we don't hear from a student, that that's really important. Um, what we know is that when students get uncomfortable, um, just like all human beings, um, they tend to avoid a situation. And so when somebody isn't responding to their teacher's emails, sometimes it's an oversight, but a lot of times it's that first, uh, it's that first warning sign that something doesn't feel right and they want to back away from the discomfort. So mm -hmm. part of helping students develop a growth mindset is leaning in when it becomes uncomfortable. And so the first piece is to train them when something feels hard to reach out to help. Um, we do that all the time um, in face-to-face -face schools in our advisory program. And when even informally, when we pass a student in the hallway and you sort of pull them aside and say, hey, how's it going? We don't have hallways. And so we have to figure out other systems to get those students to us and to reach out and to train them to reach out to us too. You know, Liz, I've heard you say to schools at times, the good news about this situation is that the kids who you were worried about before starting the situation off, before starting the distance learning situation off, are probably the same kids that you should be worried about now. Can you speak to just why you know that and even the data that you have that supports that? Sure. So let me start with the data. Um, you know, I mentioned that you need different data in an online space. And so one of the things that we track very carefully is who we reach out to when we have concerns. So we know that every, we've tracked this data now for three years, so it's pretty consistent, that about 60% of our students get all the support they need from their teacher. That they, that they run into a tricky spot, they ask their teacher, their teacher gives them the support and they never hit any of those flags that I was talking about. They get everything that they need. Um, th we have another probably 20% that at some point over the course of the academic year need one or two of those reminders. Um, they need me to reach out in my role as director of school support and they need their on-campus contact to, to hopefully to reach out to them as well. Um, and that usually that that just sort of takes that little nudge and everything falls into place and the student picks up on, picks up the behaviors that he or she need in order to be successful and they're able to implement them for the rest of the year. Um, we know that we have about anywhere in a given year between five to 8% of students who need ongoing sustained help. I'll tell you from my work as a Dean of Students that that number is pretty consistent what I saw in the halls of the school too. Um, and so mm -hmm. those students, um, usually when we're reaching out about them, the school says, yeah, that doesn't surprise me um, because these are the students who often have a hard time getting work in or maintaining positive study habits or working independently. 
So what we know is that the way that a student behaves at school is typically the way that they behave online. Is that always true? No, not 100% of the time, but it's a pretty good place to start. And so as you're moving to distance learning, if you have students who you know are on that concern list regularly, you're going to want to plan to be checking up on them regularly in this context too. You know, I'll also say that right now we're in uncharted territory. And in terms of the toll that the current crisis is taking on all of our students, um, on our families and on our communities, that we know that probably kids will be having a little bit of a harder time than they might have in face-to-face -face schools. That's not about the transition to distance learning so much as it is about living where we are at this moment of, in time. And so um, I just would encourage you that when you, hit, when you have kids who run into distress, because everybody's going to have a few of those, to make sure that you're putting it in the context for them of what's going on in the bigger picture. Um, every year, um, usually in the third week of school, I get emails and calls from schools who say, I have the student and he says he just can't learn online. And what we, what I usually say is, first of all, this is exactly when we would expect somebody to run into trouble. So here we all are, most of us are in week three of distance learning. This mm -hmm. is where the rubber hits the road. This is right. where uh, it stops being new. This is where also probably most of our teachers have sort of been, been you know, slowly ramping up to full piece, whether it's they started with review for, for lower school students or whether with upper school students, you figured out like, well, let's just, let's keep it slow so we are all learning how to do this. Well, now here we are in week three, we should all know how to do this. And here we are in week three, we've got to start introducing some new material. And so quite frankly, this is probably where it's going to get a little tricky for some people. Mm -hmm. um, what we know is that every student can learn online. And we also know that it's harder for some people than it is for others. Um, the way that we talk about it at one schoolhouse is we don't expect you to come to our online courses with all of the metacognitive skills that you need to succeed. What we expect is that you come ready to build them. And that means being flexible, being willing to consider new ways of doing school and organizing time and being open to feedback. So I would be really surprised if you aren't having students and families who are going through that right now at your school. Um, and it's okay. Um, the other thing that I say in week three is, listen, you've learned how to do school one way for you know, some of you, 10, 11, 12 years for our seniors. Um, you're doing school in a new way. That's like being a football player taking a yoga class for the first time. It's, it's not that you're not in great shape. It's not that you're not a great athlete, but you're being asked to do something you haven't done before. And so it will be, you will be sore. You will have some aches and pains. You will think, I don't know how to do this. But those skills, those foundational skills that you have there, those are going to stand you in good stead. The values and the goals in distance learning are the same just the tools are different. Okay, so Liz, I'm gonna pose something to you here. You've just talked about the really proactive and positive ways that we can answer the question, I can't learn online or my child can't learn online, right? We might get that from parents these days too. What are some of the things that we should avoid saying in those conversations as well? Um, so the first thing that I avoid is saying is okay, and just sort of accepting mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah. You know, so that's that's the first thing. Um, you know, this you is want to show empathy to the situation, yes. but you don't want to accept the premise right. that distance learning is not for that child or for a group of kids or whatever it might be. Right. Yeah. So right. thank, yes, of course. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Um, but the other thing we say is yes, it's hard. It's okay yeah. for it to be hard. And here's the thing: most of our students have as a big part of their identity being good at school and being good students. And so to be in a new environment, which every single student in the country is right now, that's, that's destabilizing and that's scary. And what you do when you're scared is you freeze up and you say, I can't do this. And so we have to help people establish a growth mindset about this moment. Um, I, can't, I don't know how to do this yet is different than I can't do this at all. 
Um, yeah. And the uh, sorry, can I just roll one more thing? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, the other thing that I'd say is that we know that one of the biggest indicators of success in an online course is a student's relationship with teachers. And this is where you at your schools have this all sewn up because your teachers know your students and your administrators know your students. And those relationships, those connections, people know your students and your families know how much you care about them. They know where your values are. They know that you are in their corner. And this is the place to pull on those relationships and to remind people how much you care about them and that you are going to get through this process with them. It may not always be grateful, graceful. Um, you may not always feel grateful, um, but you will get through it together because that's the kind of school that you are. Uh, that's so good. And and Liz, I think you and I have um, have been recipients of messages from schools and kids and parents over the last couple of weeks. Interestingly, we've heard from a few parents of kids who struggled at the beginning of this year who are now saying, thank goodness my child started to take an online class earlier this year because they're prepared differently to move into this scenario now. I, it, it, it is interesting to see uh, how when how when that conversation three weeks in, which is kind of where we are, um, can be framed as a positive growth moment rather than the oh yeah I get this and and you're right moment. Uh, the the conversation and the learning can change quite a lot. So let's um, first, folks, if you want to start putting questions into the Q and A, um, please go ahead and do that. Uh, I I don't want to be the only one asking questions, but I'll continue to ask them of Liz and, unless there are others. Um, this one relates to a question that Peter has put in here. Liz, can you talk about structures that schools might want to think about putting into place to identify these kids? I, I know you said you know you had the two assignment uh, structure as 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 if kids were missing two assignments, then that was one thing. Um, but you also are talking about kind of time being of the essence on this. And so this is going to look different than a typical school structure. Yeah. So let me talk about the system that we've developed at one schoolhouse that, um, and then sort of open that up to what that might look like for your community. So we send a, a questionnaire out to our teachers every week. We send it out on Monday. We want it back by Tuesday night. Um, and we say, tell us about any student who you're concerned about. And then we list those flags that for us are, are sort of those non-negotiable thresholds of concern, things like a grade threshold or the missed assignments. Um, but our teachers, because they're independent school teachers and they know their students really well, um, they're also looking at other things. I'll sometimes get a note from a teacher saying, you know, the, the kind of, the, the, her answers have gotten a lot shorter lately and I wonder if everything's okay or saying, um, you know, there's a big project due, she ha he hasn't logged in a lot, I'm just concerned, it could come in and be fine, but, but I'm just a little worried here. So we, we have some things that we need to know about, and then we say to our teachers, use your skills and tell us what you know um, and, and where you're worried. When we get that information, we then email, send an email out to the student and to um, an administrator at their school. For us, we call that person on campus the one schoolhouse advisor. Um, and we say, it, the message is pretty simple. We say, here's what we're worried about. Here's how you're doing right now. Here's the snapshot of your grade. And here's what you can do to get back on track. Those three, those three pieces, where, what we're worried about, what, where you are right now, and what your next steps are, are the basis of that plan. We send that out to the student and the advisor. Um, and then we trust on that connection then to continue to support students. So you may find, depending on how you're communicating out with your faculty and your staff, you may find that a form is a really useful way to, to do it. Um, for us, it works well because we use a Google form. It aggregates in a Google sheet. We can sort, we can take a look at the data. We can break it down by course. We can break it down um, by teacher or by school. So for instance, we might notice that, oh my goodness, this week, we have a lot of kids in AP Gov who are struggling and that's unusual. Can I reach out to the teacher and give some support? So it also helps us to support our teachers better. We, um, I would recommend having a system of some kind. For one thing, because consistency is really important. 
um, and keep that sim system as simple as you can. Um, there don't need to be tiers. There don't need to be forms. Say, tell me what you're worried about and tell me what somebody can do to fix it. Um, I will tell you that even in an online program, nine times out of 10, the advice that we are giving is the same advice that you would give in your classroom. It's get the work done and meet with your teacher. Um, nine times out of 10, that does the trick. So uh, Beth has an interesting question for you, uh, Liz. She wants to know if they're overdoing it. So she note, notes that we've been jumping on communication with parents rather uh, early rather than later. If a student misses more than one synchronous class or if she isn't communicating with her teachers in any given week, uh, we copy the parent on an email to a student. We're considering giving the students a few days to respond. But like you copied the advisor, we thought that even for seniors right now, more oversight is better. Are we overdoing it? Ooh, such a good question. So different school to school. Um, so. Mm -hmm. I, so there are some schools where that would not be overdoing it, where that is the level of, uh, of, of communication that parents expect. Um, and the schools have different levels of autonomy that kids have at different grades and in different programs. Um, and if you're a school where you know one of the things that you really focus on is building autonomy and those soft skills, my guess is that you might want to loosen up. If you're a, if you're a school where you know that advisors follow along, that parents check online grade books regularly, more communication is better. Um, I joke that in my job, people ask me questions and my answer is always, it depends. <laughs> um, but that's because I work with 160 schools every year. And, um, and it, there are a lot of commonalities between schools and there are a lot of things that are unique about culture. Um, I do think that it's really important that those conversations about support not be gotcha conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. for example, a few years ago, we changed how we communicate. We used to just send our commu communications of concern to the on-campus advisor. Um, and we'd say, you know, we're really worried about this student because this is going on, can you check on them? And that put our advisors in the kind of tricky situation of pulling a kid in the hallway and saying, hey, I heard that your multivariable calculus teacher says, and that didn't feel very good to anybody. So we started CCing the student on those emails. So instead the conversation could be, hey, I saw that, your te that, that one school has reached out to you. How can I help with that plan? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that when Beth, in this particular situation where you're talking about copying the student, on there, I think the student needs to be a part of the conversation. Um, and that if you were just going to parents first before yeah. you told the student, that would be more of the kind of thing I would say, maybe rethink this. Um, but it seems like what you're doing is you're allowing the conversation to open up. And that's really important. It needs to be, it needs to be focused on the student and on the student's agency. Uh, and Beth notes uh, that her message is to the students and they're copying parents. And that seems appropriate in a lot of settings right now. It's actually, it's a conversation that's ongoing actually with us, with Liz and yeah. between Liz and me right now. Um, we've just changed uh, a little bit of our approach uh, in that um, when we see students who are really on the verge of, um, of failing or, uh, or falling terribly, terribly behind in their work with us, um, we kind of have new thresholds where now we're also copying parents in uh, to messages just knowing that support has to be different in this weird learning environment that we're all in now. Yep, I will also tell you that we're in our second week of doing that and we're starting to see really good data that that's working just in one week. So that's I great. Think, yeah, in this, listen, we are all developing new systems. You can be an entirely online program and we're still developing systems because this is affecting everybody. Yep. So Jenny asked a question that Liz, I don't know if this one's directly to you, I might take a first stab at answering it and then, and then let you chime in here too. And folks, please feel free to put any more questions in here. We'll be ending in five minutes. We probably only have time for two or three more questions. Um, uh, she asks how our online delivery should change as we look to staying uh, online through the remainder of the school year. Um, and Jenny, I guess the first thing I'd, I'd say is, uh, you're not gonna like this potentially too, but it depends. 
Um, it depends <laughs> on kind of what you started with and uh, what your goals are for the remainder of the year. Uh, we know that, uh, that routine is good for kids in times of crisis. And so shifting the schedule, for example, week to week is probably not your best move. Um, shifting the percentage of online learning versus, uh, or sorry, versus synchronous learning versus asynchronous learning is probably not your best place for, uh, for change and fluidity right now. However, teaching practices will evolve over the course of the spring. And I think that we all know that, and yet at the same time, can't expect our teaching and learning to change overnight, as I think some schools are thinking that it will right now. Uh, I like to tell people that it takes us six months at one schoolhouse of training and coaching to help a, a great independent school faculty member become a great online teacher. You didn't have six months, you barely had two days to get up and going. So don't let perfect be the enemy of good in, situa in this situation. If you're creating routine, and if you're creating an environment where students can be connecting with their teachers regularly, and where students know that they have the care and support around them in order to find some success, and they're learning a few things as they go along, that's probably where our expectation should be for the remainder of this school year. Um, anything beyond that and the lessons learned beyond that um, are wonderful and great, but probably not where our general set of expectations can be. At the same time, I'm going to tell you that one thing that we are seeing a real challenge for academic administrators on right now is their highest flying faculty members, because some of those high flyers are trying a whole bunch of things which takes the focus off of the learning and puts it onto the technology, which is not where we want the focus to be at all. So I, I've had a lot of conversations in just the last week about having to rein in some of those higher flying faculty members rather than letting them soar in the really interesting ways that we're used to doing. It's almost the exact opposite advice that I've been giving to schools for years now on this topic. Um, so, Jenny, I feel your question because I just got an email from my, uh, my kids' school yesterday that they are indeed closed for the rest of the year. So, I'm feeling this as a parent at the same time that we're working with schools that are doing the same um, thing. So, one of the things um, that I am taking um, from my parent life and bringing into my work life here is um, how deeply parents do not understand the magnitude of what, you, what we are asking our faculty to do. Um, I was on a parent call the other night and a um, and parent who I know well said, he said, let me ask you as an educator, why can't the school just get it together? And I just thought like, oh, it's a really good thing we're separated by a screen here because if we were in the same room, this would not go well. Um, <laughs> But what I would encourage you to do as you are thinking about what comes next is how you communicate that to parents. Um, in part because parents have so much faith in your teachers and they know how great your teachers are. Um, they don't understand that we're asking somebody to swim in jello right now. Um, you know, it's our teachers have our extraordinary educators. And I say that regardless of the school, the city, the division, the kind of school you are in. People become teachers because they care about kids and they care about their growth and they care about learning. Nobody is more frustrated right now than teachers. And I say that as a parent of two 10 year old boys. Um, we need to help our parents understand that what we're doing is the best thing for their kids. Um, you know, it's sort of a truism that um, if, you've been to, if you've been a student, you're an expert on schools, right? Um, and everybody kind of thinks that they know what school is supposed to look like. Um, nobody knows what school is supposed to look like right now. And that's okay, because nobody knows what this world is supposed to look like right now, except that we wanna keep people safe and healthy and we wanna build resilience. So the more you can help families see that that's the goal, that the goal here is not finishing up 11th grade ready for AP Calculus BC. The goal is getting your student ready for a world where they're engaged in learning, ready to thrive, able to put things in connection, 
and also where they are building the skills of autonomy, independence, time management, and prioritization that are essential to their success in as they get older. And the older they get, the more essential they go. These are essential college readiness skills. We may not be giving students the content they expected to have, but we are still teaching them. And arguably the lessons that we're teaching them now are the ones that they are really going to use for the rest of their lives. Liz, I think that's a perfect place to end. So thank you so much for taking some time to share your thoughts. Uh, my guess is we may do a follow-up webinar at some point later this school year too, um, as we start talking about how to end the year um, with student support, because there are some other things to think about there, including things like comment writing. So thanks again for your, your time on this. And, uh, and folks, again, next week we'll be focusing on uh, uh, standardized assessments as un to help us understand what gaps might be emerging uh, in the learning this spring. Uh, let us know if there's anything else that we can do. We're always happy to uh, be able to work with you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.